Um, it's an exaggeration to call this a paper. Um, essentially what it is is <clears throat> um, an exploration of um, some new data that landed on our lap how long ago? Just about a, uh, it feels about two, about 10 days ago. Um, and that data comes from, the, uh, from a flash survey of the 2017 chess data set. So that really is what I'm going to be kind of talking to. And um, a cleavage perspective kind of underlies this or overhangs this at some, at some distance really, and, and that may come out either in the questions or I might, if I have some time, I will uh, engage that uh, a little bit. Uh, but essentially it is a kind of a, a show and tell, which is um, in which there are two uh, decisions. One, we decided to uh, focus on Europe, European integration and uh, multiculturalism, the two key issues for understanding a change in party systems. Um, and second of all, we decided to make a, uh, a comparison, a sharp comparison where we could, uh, between the, the last chess before the, uh, the Great Recession, that was in 2006, and the current data, which is 2017. Um, and the topics that, we, that uh, we're going to um, engage right, um, right here are key topics for, for party system change. Uh, that is the positional change, uh, average weighted uh, positional change within uh, party systems, uh, polarization, the polarization of political parties uh, at the country level and also um, across the board for the countries we have, uh, the alignment of, of these issues, the alignment of European integration um, and uh, multiculturalism, and to a pattern of intra-party um, divisions. Um, and um, this is the Chapel Hill uh, flash survey that we are using. We normally, we, we now have a, a routine whereby we um, synchronize the Chapel Hill expert survey with the EES survey, which takes place at European Parliament elections. Uh, so this is out of, out of sync uh, with that. Um, and it's, uh, we conducted this in the context of an EU Engage uh, Horizon 2020. So we have uh, 24 items, and normally more items in the, in the regular Ch uh, Chapel Hill survey. Uh, there are just 14 countries. Uh, the distribution is quite nice across the South, East, and uh, Northwest, but it's less than the 30 plus countries that we would uh, normally have. So we have in total here uh, 132 parties, 228 experts, and you can see the uh, time series. This is panel data. Uh, the investigators in alphabetical order, uh, beginning with uh, Ryan uh, and Lisbeth, uh, most of whom um, no longer live in the uh, Chapel Hill um, area, but all over the place. <laughs> uh, and um, we'll just go back one, and I'm just reminded there, the, uh, the data is currently being cleaned um, and should be, I better be careful here, and should be available in the um, uh, um, late spring or early summer of 2018 if you're interested and that is the, uh, the site where you can uh, access it. Um, and let's begin with party system positional change. And we thought quite long and hard about this. Is there a way to disaggregate this in a meaningful way? And the way um, we will have it here, and this is not in the paper, but, uh, uh, but Hans-Peter uh, had access to a, a, a version of this uh, in, in slides. So we have the overall shift which is the change in mean issue position of all political parties uh, for a particular country weighted by a vote. And we break this down into three elements. And I think the elements are gonna be pretty kind of interesting and they reflect on the geographical um, regions that, uh, that have now become quite a standard in the analysis of, of uh, party system change. And the first of these is position shift. That is the change in the issue positions of political parties that are present in year zero and year one. For us, this is two, here, it's 2006 and 2017, holding vote constant. So how do the extent, what, what happens to the extent of political parties? How do they change their position? And how can you understand the effect of that, assuming that the vote didn't change? And the second element is vote shift. Change in the vote for those parties, those extant parties, holding position constant. 
So this is actually a very simple way of, of, of disaggregating positional change. And then you have new parties. Party replacement across year, uh, across the two years, year zero and year one, weighted by position and vote. So those are the three uh, disaggregated elements that I'm going to be uh, showing you uh, for um, the individual 14 countries. Okay, beginning with Central and Eastern Europe. And so what you see here is, first of all, uh, the, um, the gray bar, which is the overall position shift, averaged and weighted by, uh, by, by vote for the parties in those um, individual countries. I wish I, had, I wish I could make out the countries more clearly here. Maybe I'll look at it on my thing here. So what you see there, I mean, the largest shift is in Hungary, and that's on the left-hand side. And the scale is different there if you're able to, uh, uh, to see that. And essentially what is going on here, thank you, is um, a shift in party positioning. And so what essentially you've got there is this enormous shift by Fidesz. It's actually a shift from seven on a zero to 10 scale, from 7.5 to 2.7. I mean, Downs would be in his element here because you've got leapfrogging of political parties. You've got Fidesz chasing Jobbik, which was if there's a word, undemonizing itself from 2006, which became in the 2014 election, the most recent election in Hungary, the, with more than 20% of the vote, this, the second largest party. So Orban was moving right across the political spectrum on European integration, and, uh, and that is that light blue, the turquoise uh, bar there. Um, if you go across to um, Estonia, there you go. So the light gray bar shows uh, an increase in the average weighted positional change of parties there. And the light blue bar is this major change by, uh, by EK. This is this uh, center party, um, which shifted all the way in favor of European um, integration. And it struck me when I was reading uh, Catherine's uh, paper that this is something actually that could be encompassed within your theory because essentially what's, if you, if you look at the, uh, the EK, an English translation of their manifesto, this was 2015, most recent election, um, you see them mentioning, actually I counted the number of times, it was 47 times they mentioned Europe. And in every context it's in terms of the foreign policy, security. And Estonia, if you imagine Estonia out of the Europe, it doesn't want to be imagined outside of the European Union. I mean, there isn't that alternative because of the, the, the security threats and the, and the foreign policy threats that uh, Estonia uh, faces. Um, let's, I could talk, one can talk, each country has got its own story, but those are the two kind of big stories there. Let's move on. Um, this is Northwest Europe, and it's a very different picture. So in Eastern Europe, you have a picture of positional change among extant parties. And you've got to think, you know, what's going on there? Well, what might be going on is that the, the, the brands of the parties, to the extent that the brand of the party is not deeply rooted, so there is a greater potential for individual parties to change their stripes. And that's what you see in Eastern Europe. That is not the case in Northwestern Europe, where the brands, the positional commitments of parties, are very deeply rooted. And so what you see in North. West Europe is the, the predominant source of change is, the, is, is our new parties. Uh, I'm, uh, the United Kingdom is not part of Northwest Europe. That's just there by accident. <laughs> um, so let's talk, let's, in, in France, of course, it's on, on, in March. That's the, the green bar. The, the, the blue bar is the decline of the Socialist Party. In Germany and Sweden, it's the growth of radical town parties. It's the growth of the AfD and the the, the radical town uh, SD in, uh, in Sweden. In the United Kingdom, by virtue of the high barrier to new party creation, it's, the action is within the parties, and that is the, the, the light blue bar, which describes the remarkable shift <coughs> of Labour, 2006 was Blair's last full year in office, from a Labour to, to Corbyn. And despite what Corbyn says about the... Uh, the, the customs union, joining the customs union, the Labour Party shifted dramatically in a Eurosceptical uh, direction over the past, over the past uh, decade, and that is that light blue bar there. So there's a very clear kind of regional um, contrast 
in the sources of positional change in uh, party systems. Uh, let's go to uh, Southern Europe, there we go. Um, a big mover there is uh, it Italy. I mean, every change here is in a negative direction on European integration towards Euroscepticism. Um, and M5 is the, uh, is, is the green bar, negative bar there. Um, in Greece, what you have, the, the light, you want to just go to Greece? The light, okay, the dark, the dark blue bar is, um, is a, the 90% the decline of PASOK. Um, PASOK just virtually disintegrated. And the light blue bar is um, Syriza, the experience of government and a shift. And Syriza is now at 7.0 on a 0 to 10 scale. So it's, uh, by our measure, relatively pro, uh, pro, uh, pro uh, Europe. So let's, um, let's move on. I did, let me just say a word before we move on. It, this is one of those examples where, so that's the country picture for across 14 countries. But when you aggregate, sometimes you can see things that you cannot see in pieces when you, in, 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 for individual countries. And that's very much the case here. So when we aggregate, let's aggregate right, right now. So this is the aggregation across the 14 countries over the past decade. And so what you see in the gray bar is a very definite shift in a Eurosceptical direction on average. But what you see in the turquoise bar, the absence of a turquoise bar, is that party positioning, changes in party positioning wash out. So what you have in the, in the shifts, if you're interested in individual parties and you're trying to make a big story, the big story for individual parties is that individual parties are, have incentives to move one way or the other. That is, it, it, it resembles more or less a random walk. That individual, across those 14 countries, across that decade, individual party change washes out. And, and the story that you would have to tell has to be the green story of new parties. So we're talking about, we're not talking about a Downsian world. The Downsian world, that's the 1960s and, and, and for many countries the 1970s. That's where the game for, for Downs, if you read him kind of carefully, is it's a game where voters are pretty much fixed, where the game is party competition in luring voters towards parties. It's a game that kind of makes sense in the United States, where the barriers to party creation are very high. It's a game that makes sense, and that is the case, in the United Kingdom but it's not a game in PR uh, systems. Not now, because we're living in a, a period of great discontinuity of, par of party systems. And so that light, <coughs> that kind of funny green uh, bar there, what you have, it's new parties. And so when you enumerate the number of um, radical town parties, we have eight of them above 2% of the vote. We have eight of them in, in 2006 and 15 of them in 2017. That is the systemic change that we see um, in, um, in Europe, plus some considerable vote shift in a Eurosceptical direction among the extant uh, uh, political parties. Okay, then there's a, a variety of additional slides for the final three dimensions of party system change. Um, one of them is showing that individual parties, in terms of their position change, it's relatively small. And if you look at it on European integration, it's plus 0.15. So the overall story is a very significant diminishment of pro-Europeanism, a move towards Euroscepticism. You don't see it. You simply don't see it when you look at individual or political parties. What you see there, if you can read it, on the far left is Fidesz more than three standard deviations from uh, the mean. We're talking about a chance of one in 10,000 if you looked at this probabilistically. Um, almost all of the parties, with two exceptions, are from Eastern Europe or the UK. I include the UK in Eastern Europe as far as, um, as this is concerned. It, it's, a, it's a country that's trying to move to the United States, into the Atlantic, but it's actually succeeding in moving into Eastern Europe. Um, 
also the change on, on multiculturalism. I mean, there's, 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 it, it's even greater stability there. Parties in Europe, generally speaking, find it very difficult, with the exception of some parties in Eastern Europe, find it very difficult to change their brands. These are rooted in the minds of voters. And to get inside the mind of a voter, it's not an easy thing to do, because voters have very little time, very little incentive to start reconfiguring their brains because somebody in a political party says, oh, we, we've, we're changing our, our spots. That's a very, very difficult thing to, uh, to achieve. Uh, Blair tried to achieve it with uh, New Labour, and that took him several years and a whole series of symbolic uh, battles. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. Um, this is a, a series of bars which indicate the total vote for parties positioned across the girl town dimension, green alternative, libertarian, traditional authority, nationalism. Um, actually, this is the, this is the, that's something wrong with that. Okay, well, I, I'm just gonna describe it. And what it shows is this, there's been a, a, a significant shift from those three central bars to the two bars on either extreme, to the gal side and to the town side. And I can tell you what that shift amounts to. In 2006, parties in that middle region commanded 62.5% of the vote. In 2017, they commanded 45% of the vote. So that's a shift over that 10-year period or 11-year period of um, 17.5%. And now the extremes have a majority of the vote on that girl town uh, dimension. That's what that is meant to uh, show. Why it doesn't come out, I don't know. Carry on. Um, this is polarization. And we measure polarization quite simply as the position of political parties as measured by chess, the experts who we asked to evaluate parties in chess, they're mean, and we weight that by the vote of a political party, and the polarization is simply that weighted standard uh, deviation. And what you see is that um, across the vast majority of those 14 countries, there's been an increase in polarization from 2006 to 2017, uh, and an increase in multiculturalism. The two kind of exceptions are the UK and Italy. And the reason there are exceptions is that in both countries there has been a decided shift away from European integration in the UK and away from multiculturalism in Italy. And actually this is the, we, we, we have not put in the, the recent election data, but uh, it, you get roughly the same pattern if you, if you do so. Well, Lisbon put in the new data, so. It's the new data. Okay, that's, uh, that, that's what that shows. Polarization um, has increased, and in many countries it's increased considerably. Yeah. This is a, a two charts for European integration and for multiculturalism. Uh, the solid line is salience. Um, this is a quadratic fit. And the, um, um, and the dots and the, uh, the dotted line, the, the dashed line, um, is the, the uh, internal party divisions. And what you see, first of all, is that these are mirror image. Say that? Oh, I'm, I'm, out of, I'm running out of time. OK, I'm going to really, really uh, speed up here. Um, you see, these are mirror images of each other. And I want to make two points, and that is one, the radical town parties have greater salience and less divisions than any other party family, that's one. And two, they attach greater significance to multiculturalism and to European integration in our data. Next slide. Uh, this shows the alignment, that is the simple correlation weighted by party vote um, of European integration and multiculturalism. All the countries above that diagonal line have increased the alignment. And the three countries that kind of escape that close alignment are the southern countries, Greece, Portugal, and Spain. And the reasons they do so, um, I think it's the result of an interaction of, of two variables, really two theories. 
One has to do with the effect of the Great Recession, which was so much more severe in the South. But the other, unless discussed, is a kind of a, he's not here, but a kind of a Bartolini um, a theory which would, talk, which would um, explain the fragmentation of the left historically um, in those countries and the continual existence of a radical left, a party. And that would be a way of trying to bring in a cleavage approach to understand the distinctiveness of Southern Europe. Let's, uh, let's go straight on. All right, this is my last kind of substantive slide. And this is something that I just can't resist sharing with you. And that is, I think every single person around this table believes that we can best understand party systems in terms of two dimensions. And yet, when we describe radical tan parties or radical nationalist parties or radical parochial parties, I don't care what you call them, when we describe them as radical right parties, we are making an assumption that it's single of single dimensionality. And the red ellipse encompasses the radical tan parties. The blue ellipse encompasses the major right party, economically right party. And what you can see is there's hardly any overlap in terms of left-right. So it's only by confusing, by melding together these, the two dimensions of a socio-cultural dimension and an economic left-right that we can possibly describe them as radical right. They're not right parties. And so uh, that's my last statement. And then the summary of, of, of just some of the points that, uh, that uh, I've made. The positional shift to Euroscepticism is chiefly the result of voter switch and new parties, not change of position among extant parties. Voters have moved to the extremes. Party polarization has increased. Polar parties are more unified. They also have greater salience. Europe and multiculturalism have become more aligned, except in the South, for reasons I think we can explain. Thank you.